Here's Greg Kugel to misunderstand the science behind the Big Bang. Many people believe the universe didn't come from nothing, but an unknown theoretical, naturalistic, or mythical cause. Why is the Christian God logically necessary in light of endless other explanations that try to fill the same blank? Okay, I'm glad uh, for this question uh, because it, <clears throat> I think, betrays a misunderstanding of the argument that I offer, all right? Um, given, and this is an important given, the origin of the universe, given that the, there was when there was no universe, and then there was a universe. No, there was no when there was no universe. There was never a time when the universe did not exist. The universe is the space-time continuum, so whenever there is time, there is a universe, even if there was nothing but time. Time is an extension of the universe. The reason I don't believe that the universe could have a cause is because to cause something to exist means to do something that results in a change from a time when that thing does not exist to a time when it does exist. Since there never was, or even coherently could be, a time when the space-time continuum didn't exist, the universe could not have had a cause. Okay, we're talking about standard Big Bang cosmology. Standard Big Bang cosmology absolutely does not say that there was a time when the universe did not exist. And even if it did, that would contradict the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. If God created the universe at a particular time, then he didn't create the universe out of nothing. Time would have existed rather than nothing. And there is a tremendous amount of observational, astronomical evidence for that and... Um, uh, evidence in, in general relativity and in special relativity. What evidence does Greg think shows that there was ever a time when the universe didn't exist? Given that such a thing is impossible by definition, how could evidence for such a thing even be possible? So this is theoretical physics and in uh, philosophy. So there's a range of arguments in favor of the universe coming into existence. And I mean the whole shebang, the whole physical kind of thing. Well, the whole physical kind of thing would include time. Time is a physical phenomenon. It is part of what is studied and described by physics. How can you create time when there was never a time when time didn't already exist? You can't create something when it already exists, and since there was never a time when time didn't already exist, it therefore could not have been created. There's been attempts to find or to, to exploit what Stephen Meyer has called a quantum loophole, where you make a jump to quantum physics. Uh, I think Krauss does this in his book, A Universe from Nothing, and argues that certain mathematical things need to be in can be in place that then have an effect of causing the universe. The, the problem is with this is mathematics are abstract, an abstract entities are, have no causal power. Well, no, that's not the problem. I haven't read Krauss's book, so I'm not sure that this is even an accurate summary of his argument. But if it is, the problem is that math is a set of ideas, and ideas are activities carried out by brains. Brains can't exist without a universe to exist in, so they can't precede the universe or cause it to exist unless they cause this universe to exist from inside of some other universe, some other space-time continuum. That wouldn't really be a universe from nothing, though, would it? Mathematical ideas don't exist as some kind of non-physical platonic forms. Those aren't even coherent. And they're certainly not abstract in the sense that Greg has in mind if Greg insists that abstract objects have no causal efficacy, because mathematical ideas clearly do have causal efficacy. They are ideas that we use as tools. You can't use something as a tool if it is causally inert. And also, abstract entities... Um arguably exist in a mind. <laughs> they are cognitive activities carried out by a brain. In fact, a mind is just a set of such activities. They have to be carried out by an entity which inhabits space-time. A mind, because it is an activity, certainly needs time. You can't carry out any activity without time existing in which to do so. That's why God, insofar as he is defined as a timeless, spaceless, disembodied mind, is an incoherent notion. How could a mind exist with no time in which to carry out the activities of thinking, feeling, perceiving, etc.? These activities are the essence of what a mind is. So... 
even if you are arguing in that way from math, you still have no material world. You have math as abstract entities that are not active but rather inert, and you have a mind that holds the abstract entity, so a non-physical mind. A non-physical mind is a contradiction in terms. And that's precisely what they're trying to avoid. So I don't think that solves any problems. Uh, the evidence we have now, and I'm not talking about the th theoretical models. There are all kinds of models that are being offered as – a ways of explaining the universe without resorting to a um, a divine mind as the responsible cause. Okay, here is the way my argument works. Given the beginning of the universe, and by the way, there's there's some other important work uh, by Bord, Guth, and Vilenkin. It's called the BGV theorem that says any universe that is expanding, no matter how you conceptualize it, had to have an absolute beginning. As far as I know, the consensus is that the universe is finite in the past. It doesn't look like it's been around for infinite time. However, Greg is wrong to say that this is proven by the bourdais guth vilenkin theorem. Alan Guth, one of the folks who came up with the BGV theorem, disagrees that it says that any expanding universe had to have a beginning. Now, you might think that, you know, there's a theorem by Alan Guth and Arvind Borde and Alex Vilenkin that says the universe had a beginning. I've explained to you why that's not true, but in case you don't trust me, I happen to have Alan Guth right here, one of the authors of the bourdais guth vilenkin theorem. Alan, what do you say? He says, I don't know whether the universe had a beginning, I suspect the universe didn't have a beginning. It's very likely eternal, but nobody knows. Now, how in the world can the author of the bordeguth vilenkin theorem say the universe is probably eternal for the reasons I've already told you? The theorem is only about classical descriptions of the universe, not about the universe itself. That was Sean Carroll pointing this out to William Lane Craig in a debate nearly 10 years ago. But apologists are still saying that the BGV theorem says something that one of its creators explicitly says it does not say. So the evidence, the actual evidence for an, uh, an actual beginning, an absolute beginning of our universe is very, very strong. Um, even though there are many cosmologists who don't yet want to acknowledge it. And uh, I think Alan Guth thinks we have an e eternal universe. Now, why would he think that if his own theorem supposedly proves that this isn't the case? I don't know how he solves the problem of the second law of thermodynamics, which is really a significant issue. The second law of thermodynamics says that entropy always increases over time. I suspect that Greg means that if the universe extends infinitely into the past, we should see a lot more entropy than we currently do. But nevertheless, there, uh, most of them say we don't know. But, uh, um, but the evidence that we have right now from those three areas, astronomical, um, theoretical physics, and um, <clears throat> third category, I just mentioned it. Uh, uh, philosophical? Philosophical, yeah. Um, uh, points to an absolute beginning. Now, with an absolute beginning in place, now you ask the question, what is the cause of the absolute beginning? That question only makes sense if we are asking about something that begins to exist within time. It does not make sense to ask it about time itself. Time itself cannot be caused to exist. To say that something was caused to exist is to say that there was a time when that thing did not exist, and then there was some kind of action that resulted in that thing existing at a later time. Since there was never a time when the space-time continuum didn't exist, Exist, it could not have been caused to exist, even if it hasn't been around for an infinite amount of time. And you have one of two options, generally speaking. So now I'm working in uh, a, a metaphysical categories. The first one that I'm using is the metaphysical category of cause and effect. Which cannot apply to the existence of time itself. You cannot cause something to exist at a time when it already exists. Since there was never a time when time did not already exist, time cannot be caused to exist. Since the universe refers to all the where's and when's of the space-time continuum, there was never a time when the universe did not exist. And the universe therefore could not have had a cause unless that cause were in some other non-contiguous space-time continuum. But then, as I previously said, this universe would not have been created out of nothing. It would have been created from within that other universe. 
cause and effect is not a scientific category because cause and effect cannot be empirically determined or seen, as it were. And David Hume made a huge deal about this. You know, he was a radical empiricist. You can't see cause and effect. You can just see things happening. And therefore, you know, he questioned the legitimacy of cause cause and effect. Yeah, the gist of Hume's argument was that you can't prove with complete certainty that two events that look causally related really are. For example, if you see a window shatter at the moment that a rock hits it, there's no way to prove with absolute certainty that the window didn't just happen to spontaneously shatter on its own, and that it was just a coincidence that it happened to shatter when the rock hit it. What Hume also said, though, was that causes have to precede effects. He said, if any cause may be perfectly cotemporary with its effect, tis certain, according to this maxim, that they must all of them be so. Since any one of them which retards its operation for a single moment exerts not itself at that very individual time in which it might have operated, and therefore is no proper cause. For if one cause were cotemporary with its effect, and this effect with its effect, and so on, tis plain that there would be no such thing as succession, and all objects must be coexistent. If causes didn't happen before their effects, then everything would happen all at once. A cause has to temporally precede its effect, which makes the idea of a cause of time itself to be altogether self-contradictory. To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.